there's nothing new under the sun. You know, that's that's ancient wisdom if ever there was any. So, in the context of, of what we do on here, in amongst the love letters and the and the rest of the channel, I, I we try to consider what's happened recently, what's happening right now, and to and to wonder if such disruption, such manipulation of vast numbers of people has precedent. Because that is what is going on. There's no doubt about it. In in unprecedented ways, I would say, in terms of scale, we are being pushed and manipulated. But it's the scale that's different. The notion of manipulating and pushing people in one direction or another is as old as the hills. And that happens again and again and again. Over the years, I've read all sorts of books about the First World War, the Great War, the War of 1914 to 1918. And its I freely admit it's a subject that enthralls me. Um, I'm horrified by its scale. But more than anything else, I think about its impact on those populations that had grown to adulthood in a Victorian Edwardian world, a, a horse-drawn world, a world of women in crinolines that had then inflicted upon it the reality of industrialised war for the very first time. I think about that more than anything. No world, I would say, was less ready, less prepared for what happened to it during those years from 1914 to 1918. Now, some years ago, I was handed a copy of a book. I was actually out with my dogs and a lady approached my wife and I and she handed, actually it was two books, um, and she said that they'd been written by her father. They'd been co-written by her father and she wanted me to have, wanted me to have them. And the, the, the one I'm talking about specifically here is Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War by Jerry Doherty and Jim McGregor. And I, I put it aside for quite a while, actually, because I was in the middle of something else. You know that way, I, I just, you know, we've all got, well, you know, if you read, you're, you've always got, I've always got piles of books waiting to go. And so I set it aside for a while, but then I, I picked it up one day. And I, I can tell you, it's quite a read. I read it for the first time a few years ago now, and it's quite a read. It's it's a bit, it makes me feel like I'm reading a novel, a thriller almost. And its hypothesis is that the First World War was the deliberate work of a group of men determined that from within the heart of the British Empire, they would take control of the world and dominate the world for the benefit of that British Empire. And implicated amongst the cast of characters, villains, I suppose, are the diamond magnate Cecil Rhodes uh, and a host of political figures, including Alfred Milner, uh, the, the fifth Earl of Rosebery, Herbert Asquith, even Edward Prince of Wales. So even, it even swept in the, the royal family of the time. As I say, it's quite a read, alleging, as it does, that the well, the famous, infamous assassination of Archduke Ferdinand was only the necessary spark that ignited a flammable tapestry of alliances and allegiances that had been carefully woven in advance by those men and their accomplices all over Europe. They set a trap and then triggered it. And Germany was the central target of their machinations according to the book, that war was deliberately fomented so as to provide the means and the momentum to destroy Germany, the Germany that they perceived as the principal obstacle and threat to their plans for world domination. So, read it, see what you think. But it raises the thought that Germany in 1914 was no threat Unless a person decided to see her that way, you know, unless a person was persuaded and hoodwinked into fearing danger where there was none and then acting accordingly. 
And I, th- I think about that in many ways, but I think about it in relation to what the f- modern day philosopher Matthias Desmet has had to say recently about mass formation psychosis. The, the idea that there are times when populations experience anxiety all at the same time. A free floating anxiety, as he describes it, in the atmosphere around them, like dark clouds that must eventually rain on someone. And so all of that line of thinking makes me wonder and ask the question, what if, what if? I look back at how we were told about the pandemic of SARS-CoV-2. I think about those films of Chinese people apparently falling over dead in the street, but that when you viewed them again, they, sh- they quite obviously show people who, well, apparently dying on their feet, but somehow they managed to get their hands out <laughs> to cushion the fall, you know, rather than actually face plant into the pavement. And then the footage from Italy of the overwhelmed hospitals there and the fear that was suddenly there. And I remember how quickly we were persuaded to fear each other, to fear family members, to fear neighbours, to fear the community at large. I remember we were told that the the National Health Service would collapse entirely under the weight of the disease unless, unless we went into our homes and shut the doors and stayed there until the government said it was safe to come out again. I remember all the stuff about asymptomatic transmission, how we were told that there was no way of knowing if you had the disease unless you took a test. What kind of disease is that? You don't know it unless you take a test for it. I think about how we know now that the elderly were put on end-of-life care. In hospitals and in care homes, they were dosed up with midazolam and morphine and hustled to the exit of life. And how those fatalities, those large numbers of the elderly all dead at once, made the death tolls for SARS-CoV-2 so apparently frightening. And I think about the experimental gene therapies that were all but mandated for billions of people around the world. I think about all of it and I wonder, what if, what if there was no deadly disease at all? What if there was no disease to fear, no danger? And people died. Before anybody, you know, reminds me in the comments or whatever, people died, I know that. But people die in their tens of thousands every year from outbreaks of seasonal viral illness, flu, what have you. What if COVID was actually nothing new? Just more of the usual rebranded as something new, given a scary new name. What if... What if all we got were not the consequences of a deadly disease, but the effects of the measures that were put in place because of the so-called pandemic? What if? What if there was no pandemic at all, just a fiction that enabled people with an agenda to take control of the world, to erase freedom, to censor inconvenient truth, to demonise an awkward minority of people that wouldn't comply, people who had questions they wanted answered. What if Germany was no danger in 1914 and the war was only the deliberate consequence of people who needed global fear, global disruption, global chaos to get what they wanted, which was control and vast wealth. Remember how we were told the war in Ukraine came out of a clear blue sky? That that Vladimir Putin sent his military across the border and into a peaceful, democratic country for no reason other than that he planned to recreate the Soviet Empire of old. Remember? And remember how we weren't told anything about the history of Ukraine, about that part of the world. We weren't told... We certainly weren't reminded about how the US, the United States, fomented a coup 
in Ukraine in 2014. A coup that led to a bloody civil war. It lasted for another eight years after 2014. And remember how we were told that the Nord Stream pipeline was sabotaged by Russia? Which seemed odd at the time, when you thought that all Russia had had to do was turn off the taps at their end, rather than destroy billions of pounds worth of Russia's own infrastructure. And remember how, just like in 1914, Germany, poor old Germany, was undermined and ruined economically by matters out with her control. And then, and then I think over and over and over about the hoax that is the climate crisis, so-called climate crisis. There's something else that we can't see, but that we're told around the clock threatens us with destruction on a scale greater than that likely to be inflicted by any war. You know, we can't see CO2, carbon dioxide, that gas that's to be our doom, but we're told to fear it just the same. Just like a virus. Can't see it, but it'll kill you. And most recently, I've been thinking about war and forever war. The lies we were told and are still being told about Ukraine, where all the billions of pounds and euros are going, and to whom the money's being paid. And already, half a million Ukrainians are dead, despite the fact that there was a peace deal on the table, ready to go, until Boris Johnson, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, was sent to Ukraine as the NATO bag carrier to scupper that deal and so consign all of those hundreds of thousands of people to the meat grinder. And still the war goes on, even though NATO plainly doesn't have and never did have any defined military objective there. And now the high-ups, the establishment, the powers that be, whatever, are talking about citizen armies, about national service. I'm even hearing the C word, conscription. Someone somewhere is seriously endeavouring to frighten us out of our wits and into some kind of stunned silence and compliance by threatening what we hold most dear, which is our children. There's nothing, there's nothing stops you talking about everything else like a threat to children, your children, my children. And this time the bogeyman is not Germany, but Russia. Russia's the baddie. Remember when last year the Canadian Parliament gave a standing ovation to an actual Nazi, a retired Nazi, an SS soldier? Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau applauded him on his feet. So did Volodymyr Zelensky, who was there in the Parliament that day, and all the Canadian parliamentarians. They celebrated how, in World War II, that old Nazi, well, a young Nazi then, had fought the Russians. How proud we were to be that he had fought the Russians. The same Russians who were, in World War II, our allies, Canada's allies, Britain's allies. Anyone familiar with George Orwell's 1984 remembered, sooner or later, how at any given moment, the people of Oceania were being told that they had always been at war with whoever they were at war with at the time. That's the deal. If they were at war with East Asia now, then the message from Big Brother was that they had always been at war with East Asia, even though the people themselves could remember silently, unrepeatably. They could remember a time when East Asia had been their allies against Eurasia, the other country. And so it was in Canada with Russia. If Russia is the enemy now, it followed that it must be true that Russia had always been the enemy. Same thing, same thing again. And round and round and round we go. All of this has happened before. And it keeps happening. What's different now is the scale. It's happening on a truly global scale now. I ask again, what if, what if there was no pandemic, no new, novel, lethal disease, just the usual seasonal 
respiratory illness that harvests tens of thousands of people every year. What if there's no need for war? No appetite for war? What if we're just being pushed and manipulated by people who have everything to gain while we have everything to lose? What if?